Hello and welcome everybody to a very, very special edition of the Buy Round interview show. Uh, recent events uh, transpired uh, have made this interview possible. A man formerly known as the Big Show now just under the name Paul White, part of the team at All Elite Wrestling, who's over in Brisbane at the moment. Paul, thank you so much for joining us here on the Buy Round. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Formerly known as, like I'm a, a disavowed superhero. <laughs> formerly known as. <laughs> is, it, is it weird to have, um, I guess, that be, be known yeah. as somebody and now you're it not is. allowed I mean, for to so be? For many years, you're called one thing. And uh, uh, I think people misunderstand or forget sometimes it's a business and there's intellectual property rights and it's a brand and whether i help build the brand or not it belongs to someone else so when you change companies that's one of the things you give up so you know you move along yeah you know, i guess uh, so you know i answered everything you know <laughs> so it doesn't matter i mean yeah. i've been called everything hey dipshit whatever i'll answer to it so it's fine i yeah. got an idea who they're talking to <laughs> yeah fair, fair play fair play uh the up and coming event in brisbane uh what can the fans expect up there uh, i mean i tell you i'm absolutely blown away by the opportunity that we're having here in february in the cauldron um i spent some time in that uh, stadium yesterday and well, the experience that I have, and I've been around a while, like God said, let there be light, I hit the switch kind of a thing, I've been around a while. That place is going to be so loud when we have the fans in there. It's going to be an unbelievable environment. Uh, I can't wait to tell the AEW talent when I go back to be excited, to be prepared, to probably have the show of a lifetime here in Brisbane. And I, I don't throw those words around loosely for marketing or gimmick purposes. That stadium... Suncorp Stadium is built just right for one incredible badass wrestling show. Yeah, so uh, I, I believe you recently at Wembley Stadium as well, coming right. here to Aust Australia. Are you uh, a fan of the outdoor arena? No, I'm not, uh, to be honest with you, because I've done big stadiums. I've done stadiums in New York and Dallas and places like that. Um, I'm not a fan of the outdoor stadiums because usually all the noise goes through the roof. You lose it, it escapes. You want that noise as a in a wrestling about you want it to reverberate and come right down on top of you. So the way Suncorp Stadium is set up where it's enclosed and they call it the cauldron for a reason, I guess, um, you can see the way the seats are set up and the way they're angled, that everything's gonna point right down to the field, which will point right down to the ring. And that atmosphere works better for you as a talent because you can really feel that energy and feed off of it. And also, that energy is not lost going out the top. When that energy is contained like that, the crowd has a better time, too. So when you look at that venue, how we'll set it up with the stage and stuff like that, trying to imagine it in my head, it's going to be probably one of the best shows that AEW has ever done. With the talent that we have on the roster now, a lot of the local talent that we have um, that are from Australia, they're going to be pushing hard to, to represent their homeland very well. And... Um, it's got the makings, probably one of the best AEW shows yet. Well, it's going to be in February outdoors. Uh, it is summer for me as a ginger. That was always a, a concern. Yeah, you're uh, flammable, right? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I, so many yeah. people used to say your head is already on fire. But that um, yeah. that outdoor arena, be, being outside in the sun, obviously uh, you've got other things that you need to worry about. You don't have the ginger hair, but you are a big guy. Any, any concerns? Well, my mom's hundred percent ginger. So I'm half ginger. So, well, uh, you know, you know I, what? I usually, enough, but yeah, yeah you, I'll, I'll, I'll sweat. You, yeah. you usually mate, look, uh, you're either a ginger or you're not. And I'm not in for, for bringing in, if you've married a ginger, you don't belong to us. You know, you know, you, you can't dye your hair red. It's you are a ginger or you're not. But for you, you I'll take you as a descendant, as a ginger. I'm a yes, yes, I am. Yes. I'm more descendant. than happy to have you on my team as as one of the gingers. We've got McGregor in there. We've got um, the, the boxer Canelo Alvarez. We, we've got some good gingers happening. Paul Scholes, a soccer player. We've got some good ones. But as you, for you as a descendant, I, I'll happily take you. It was funny. I had a feud with uh, Seamus for a while, and I kept teasing about being a ginger, and my mother calls it out. She says, you do realize your mother's a ginger, right? <laughs> like, Mom, it's wrestling. Like, calm down. Like, you know, like, 
I'm down. It's just wrestling. It's okay. I understand where I come from. It's okay. Yeah, but that that you know? cut, it cuts deep. It, it's kind of one of those only slayers you can get away with these days. The, the gingers, the the, the last, yeah. the last group of people is publicly one. acceptable to humiliate well, in public. If you're if you're really abnormally tall. It's so capable for people to, do you know how big you are? No, I, I had no idea that I'm this freakishly large human, but please do tell, tell me how big am I? So, yeah, that's funny. I've got a, I've got a friend who's, who's pretty tall and he does not, does not enjoy people commenting on his height. In fact, he gets quite rude. I think I've told the story before. Um, oh my goodness. He, I can only imagine. Go ahead. He was, he was at the in, in-laws and, um, yeah, you know, he goes upstairs with his his girlfriend at the time. One of the the the, the grandmother was like, "Oh, watch your head!" And everyone sort of laughed. It was in there at like Christmas time, and he just mm -hmm. turned around and went, "I don't know what you're laughing at. You'll be dead soon." <laughs> well, that's a little harsh. I know, but he was just he was just sick of hearing people uh -huh. take the piss out of his height. Um, that he just had enough. Well, you know, I was six eight at fourteen. I was 6'2 at 12, so I think I learned to just handle it. Um, it's a little awkward sometimes. I think now it's easier for me because I'm famous for wrestling. It was harder when I wasn't famous for anything and everybody was staring at me. And especially as a young man and a teenager, teenager it made me a little self-conscious, but I just learned it's – people don't mean anything by it. They just don't know how to react to it. You're not something they see every day. You're an oddity, and that oddity has given me a great career and allowed me to travel the world. So I'm I'm not mad about it. I don't. I'm pretty much immune to anything anyone can say about my height. Because they'll come up, how much do you weigh? And I'm like, well, would you ask a really big fat person how much they weigh? <laughs> like I mean, you know, um, you know. And when I was 500 pounds, I'd say a quarter ton of fun. You know, and, and I'd make him go do the math and think about you know what the quarter of a ton. So you know, well, actually, the, up, well, how tall are you? I'm 85 inches. And I make him run off and do the math. So you know, I have my own fun with it. There is actually um, a, it's um, with with height comes success. It's disproportionate. <laughs> I think um, if you're lucky enough to have size and being athletics it's an advantage because you know depending on what sport you're playing or what position you're playing it's always an advantage to have you can you can't what's the old saying for basketball you can't coach tall so i mean you know it, it is a little bit of advantage and there's a disadvantage in a lot of things too i mean you know like beds don't fit hotel showers you know there's no i mean it hits me right in the middle of the chest and you know, you see the van I just had to get out of. It was like unpacking 10 pounds of crap out of a five-pound bag, and it's a van, and it was just, you know, that should have been a show. I should have sold tickets to watching me get in out of this van. So, <laughs> yeah. There's good and bad with it, you know. After a while, it's just you. Live with it. You yeah, I, I think it's um, – if you're over seven foot tall, uh, you've got a one in six chance of playing in the NBA, or one in six people over seven foot tall playing the NBA uh, yeah, on the planet. Like yeah, it's something like that. Yeah, there's a flip side of it too. Like when I was younger, not to be morbid, but we'll get on a morbid subject. When I was younger in wrestling, I lived pretty hard and ran pretty hard. And uh, I was like, I'm not here for a long time. I'm here for a good time. And my friends used to get mad. Like, what are you talking about? And I was like, how many old giants do you see walking around, bro? Like how many old giants? And they're like, oh, that's sad. I said, yeah, that's why I'm having fun now. Then as I started getting closer to the Ford, I was like, wow, that got here pretty quick. Maybe I should, uh, you know start eating right and exercise and maybe take care of myself a little bit. <laughs> yeah. That's being young though, isn't it? I guess most people would yeah. it, consider that future of a, a 50, 60 year old. Like, yeah. I guess in, in a sport away, like you, you blink your eyes, you're there just like that. Yeah. yeah. But a sport I'm 52 and I don't feel 52 in my brain. I'm sure everybody that knows me will probably admit that I'm 12, but yeah, in my head, I feel younger, but you know, I'm 52 years old. I got two fake knees and two fake hips. It's, it's funny yeah. that you, when I when I well I'm 38 and nearly 39. Oh, you're a baby. So I, I always thought by the time I'm nearly 40, I'll definitely have my shit together. I, I won't yeah. be doing half the things I I do. But nah. Anyway, uh, yeah. lots of travel I involved in your your line of work. You, I believe you. It's not your first time here in Australia, but do you have a sort of set routine when you when you do travel uh, or when you come to town? Do you have a, is it you explore different parts of the city or you got your go to places? Uh, not as much as I used to. I did a lot of that when I was younger. Like I wanted to see things like when I 
First time I went to Italy, first time I went to France, first time I came here to Australia many years ago, I went and seen and done things. It's a little harder now because I don't have that uh, ability to hide. So then it turns into I can't really enjoy a lot of stuff as much as I want to because I'm, you know, there'll be fans and I have to be on. So I always want to be nice. But most of the time now when I travel, I'm, I maintain on staying hydrated and get my rest. You know, and that's my thing. Like, uh, if I wake up at 2 in the morning because I'm mentally, I'll get up, I'll do something for a couple hours and go back to sleep. I don't try to make myself sleep or any of that kind of crap. When you're tired, you sleep. When you're awake, do something and go back to sleep. So um, that's just the biggest thing is just adjusting to the time change. Yeah. It's, but, uh, now, you know, hydration is the biggest key, you know. I, I guess it's um, a very different lifestyle doing so much travel. Um do, do you enjoy that? It's not as glamorous as everybody thinks it is. It's really not. You're lugging bags through airports and catching planes and checking into hotels, and you might be in a hotel for 11 hours, and then you have to wrestle and move on to the next town. I mean, I can remember back in the days flying into Sydney, landing in the morning, catching the bus to the building at 4.30 in the afternoon, wrestling that night, then hopping on a charter after the show and flying all the way to the Perth, which is another five-hour flight and then we'd do Perth then after the show in Perth we'd be on a charter and we'd fly back to to Melbourne or something or, or even Brisbane or something like that and, and uh, it keeps you busy um, you know because you're uh, there's a scene in the movie called G.I. Jane that always makes me laugh in the beginning I don't know if you guys have had that movie over here but it's about a, a SEAL team and the uh, commander goes, when you reach our, you'll operate an operational tempo unlike anything else in the world. Being a professional wrestler is kind of like that because you don't have people carrying your bags or carrying your equipment like some of the pro teams do. You're lugging your own stuff, and you have to make your own way with everything, your own, find your food, get your meals, get your, in the States, get your own rental cars, get your own hotels, your you learn to do all that stuff. It's very self-sufficient. Yeah, I, I like so, that though. It teaches you responsibility, right? Like we, we have does, that. Uh, we're, we're in the sport that that I come from. It's that we're sort of in the middle. We get babied right. and our our asses wiped a, a little bit, but then there's that still that touch with the. We're all we're a very working class game, very working class right. sport, and it's like, well, no, we we can look after ourselves. We can handle ourselves. We can still you know go and socialize and. Um, with, with everyday people. But I, I guess my, my point I want to make about like the, the travel and obviously you have matches against each other um, and, and and you're there to compete against one another. Is it, is it a right. bit like being in, in a team? Have you got like people that you sort of hang out with a little bit more than others? Sure, you do. I mean, you know, people ask me all the time and say, uh, are you guys all friends? And I'm like, well, do you like everybody you work with? Mm -hmm. I mean, because it's a job. I mean, I have a great time. I enjoy doing entertainment. Yeah, there are people that I've worked with that I can't I can't stand. I don't want to be in their company. But when I go down that ramp and put on a show for the fans, the most important thing I do is give the fans the truest performance that I can and give them the best that I can, whether it's making somebody I absolutely can't stand look great or uh, vice versa. You know, I mean, I'm sure there's a lot of people that don't like me either. But it, the, the professional part of it comes in putting the fans first and the, and the show must go on because you can have – Problems at home, problems anywhere. You could be sick, you could be hurt. Doesn't matter. Show comes first, you know. And I've, I'm one of the old school guys that went through a lot of that stuff between, you know, working hurt, injured, but torn labrums in my hip and torn meniscus and bone on bone and pneumonia and all these other things. Didn't matter. There's a show. You got to go. I mean, I've had, you know, <laughs> food sickness from traveling. Had to get an IV right after a match because I was so dehydrated. I was my blood was about as thick as peanut butter. You know, just from being sick. But, you know, the show went on. The match had to happen. So um, I think if you make it to this level, you understand in any professional sports level, I'll say that, you understand what sacrifice and commitment is to make it to that level. Because while your friends are going out to parties or um, they're doing fun things, you're on the road. I mean, I mean, I miss Christmases, Thanksgivings, anniversaries, recitals, birthdays. I had a show. I had to work. You know, and that was 24, 25 years of doing that. But that was the commitment I made to my sport and to my job. So I think at a professional level, and those that are with you, your family and your close friends all understand, um, you know, that the job's always going to come first.
Yeah, I think that resonates with a lot, lot of athletes. I always look at the, the plus side is I'll get a random Tuesday where I don't have to do anything. And right. it, it's not about this, like, quote, unquote, quality time or, like, the important times. It's, it's, it's those bits of random time that mm-hmm. I enjoyed and just, oh, I've, I've got nothing on today and I can just yeah. – I can just be, and we don't have to, you know, make it such a big deal. It can just be, yeah. we can go for a walk to the beach and we can just hang yeah. and be in each other's company. We don't need to hype this up. Obviously, like expectation is a big one when it, you know, why why is New Year's Eve always never such a good night? It, the people are great. The drinks are great, but it's expectation, right? My favorite thing is to go to bed early and wake up next year. Yeah. I just love saying, I just love doing that. I love Oh, I'm gonna go to bed at ten o'clock, and I'll wake up next year. This would be awesome. Yeah, but you know, it's it's just little goofy, goofy stuff like that. Um, the the moments that you have with your time is when you in your family and your friends is when you give them a hundred percent of you. Because whether you're an athlete or a wrestler, you have a persona when you walk out of the front door. You mm-hmm. know, you're that footy player, or you're that pro wrestler, and and your fans will want to interact with you and you owe it to them to give them time and give them um, your attention. I think that's only fair. But when I go home, as soon as I walk through the front door, all that other crap stops. Yeah. You know, all that other, yeah. I leave everything. I don't carry my problems at home to work and I don't carry my work problems home. I leave both of them right where they are, you know, cause I, neither one of them deserve that my work doesn't deserve to have my problems at home and my family doesn't deserve to have my problems at work at home so that's one thing i think that keeps me happy and keeps me going i've been able to uh, compartmentalize and separate the two and appreciate them both you know it's pretty good sometimes when people are mad at you at home and you've got to go on a five-day trip you're like oh thank god i'm getting out of the house (laughs) You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm really going to miss you. I, I'm I'm really, really, honestly, I, I am yeah. going to miss you. I promise. I, I will. God, give me the airport pass. <laughs> but, you know, and at the same time, you know, when you're at work and you've seen the same faces and the same guys for, you know, 18, 19 days in a row, it's like, I don't want to see another guy with wrestling boots for the next three days. It's going to be awesome. Turn your phone off, throw it in a drawer, and just be home and be present. I think that's all you can do at, at this you know, and it's not, dude, look, it's not like it's that tough a job. I'll be honest. Yeah, there's a commitment to it and all that stuff. But uh, I, I'm not making the world a better place. I'm not curing cancer. I'm not a doctor. I'm not building a rocket to to go to outer space. I'm not doing anything important. I'm entertaining people. So I'm not that arrogant to think that I'm some kind of immortal, uh, essential for the quality of life of the planet. Look, I entertain people. I do the best that I can. And other than that, I'm a regular dude like everybody else. I just Look, don't mix. I, I don't mix the. Two up. I get, I get that, but you provide people with a, an escape and right. a, a, and a distraction from, like, there's some people in some pretty shitty situations, and th- through True. sport, you, you, I guess what you get to do is you get to allow them to put those issues to the side and let them forget. And and, and, all, and also it has a great, uh, it, it's a great vehicle for bringing people together. Like I, I look at obviously the, the differences in, in society at the moment, and that's been around for a long time in different communities. Sydney's a very diverse city with people from different backgrounds. But when I was playing for one team, the Canterbury Bulldogs, they had a very diverse fan group. And when we won and we were going to the finals, it was, it, Nobody cared about what uh, religion, what your sexual orientation was, a- anything like right. that. It was like, you're in blue and white. So, yes, it just helps. Right. I think it really helps. Pe- I, I I think you've undersold yourself there. I think it, it, entertainment is is about helping people forget and just bringing a bit of joy to people's lives because it can be hard to find it f- for some people. I think that's very kind, and I agree with you. 100 percent in that responsibility of when i walk out of the front door that's why i always try to be nice and kind to people because i never know somebody might be having a horrible day Mm. and me being nice to them for for however long that interaction is might actually mean something to them but with that that doesn't mean that i'm better than anyone else that's my cautionary tale don't lose yourself in your own like i tell younger guys and, and gals this all the time 
when it comes to social media, when it comes to press, you can't believe everything written bad about you and you can't believe everything written good about you either. You've got to know who you are as an individual and who you are as a talent. And that's your, your compass of how you, you stay true, especially if you're going to do this a long time. Because I've seen great talents that thought they were a lot better than they were or thought they were above other things and they fizzled out like a fart in a tornado. It's there and it's gone. You know, it, it's more of staying the course and remembering the fundamentals of what's important. And it, it's important as you treat your fan base, um, that's your investment. And also invest in yourself so that you uh, can give the best that you can to your fan base and stay employable because it's a business. Because if you can't do the job, they'll find somebody else that will. And that's part of being an athlete entertainer. If you can't put asses in seats and you can't entertain people, there's plenty of people that are ready to do the job. And that's one thing that I've gotten from day one, that it was always a business. You know, there's always somebody ready to take your spot. So you got to fight for it. Very wise words um, about life. Uh, and one of those people that may be coming to take one of those spots is yours truly. So I'm stepping into the ring for the very uh, first uh, time. I, I saw a little bit of your clip. What happened? How did this come about? Tell me. So how I'm did this curious. come about? Okay. So there's a, an event called the Beer, Footy, and Food Festival where mm -hmm. um, th there was some wrestling matches happening at Halftime Entertainment. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I've been an avid wrestling fan for, for since I was a, a – a teenager since as far back as I can remember, um, NWO, WCW, you know, the um, the Attitude Era, like they were the glory years for me. Anyway, so I'm... Me too, uh, me too. <laughs> <laughs> so always, always enjoyed my wrestling, this wrestling event's um, happening. Um, and one of the, the guys came into uh, the sort of area that I was, I was, I was enjoying some beers and, and watching some football happen. And I overheard me say something about maybe giving it a try. And he just sort of said, oh, you wouldn't last two minutes. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I, I reckon I'm, it's within my capabilities to, to compete in a wrestling ring. And then, and then it just sort of, that was the, the catalyst for it. And then they basically called me out and mm -hmm. me being me and getting that bit of a competitive twitch couldn't just let it go, and I said, well... Also, you're a half-crazy ginger, but anyway, that aside... Yeah, um, I just <laughs> thought, well, like, w w why not? I, for me, life's about um, experience, and, right. like, the professional sport was no longer an option for me, mm -hmm. um, doing a multitude of different things, and, yeah, mm -hmm. I thought, well, why not do it? Like, so mm -hmm. let's, give it a, let's give it a try, and, um, yeah, I don't know if he, if he said it's tongue-in-cheek thinking I'd just, I'd back away, but I'm not the type of person to just back away from a challenge. Well, I think that's uh, amazing that you believe in yourself enough to do that. Um, I'm glad that you're taking the opportunity. You have someone training you now. You have someone you're working with. Yes, I do. Yeah, so I've okay. done about three three sessions now and uh, done okay. some rope runs, some, some falls, some uh, practicing a couple of sequences uh, and how they... Yeah. That they may come together in a match. So I'm feeling, I'm, I'm feeling like I'm. Is, biggest thing being new is learning the, the recoil of that ring because it's not like a trampoline and it's not like a field, but there's a there's a resistance that fires back that like some people hop in the ring that have never been in a ring in the book before, and they fall down face first because that ring comes right back at you every time you take a step. So, you get comfortable in your ring. Um, that's good. You got somebody training you. Keep your fundamentals strong. Keep your ass off the top rope. Stay on the ground. And, you know, if you can't see and you can't walk, you can't fight. So poke him in the eye and take his legs out. It's all over. <laughs> so yeah. you're, you're not advising going off the top rope? No, keep your ass on the ground. The only thing that happens with great risk comes great friggin' disasters in pro wrestling. Like, everybody wants to do something exciting. I do a tuple, Lindy, a uh, moonsault. I, I did all that crap too when i was younger i did drop kicks off the top rope and i tried to do pretty stuff and arn anderson is one of my mentors for years and and arn gave me grief one day because i was doing drop kicks and all this pretty stuff and he goes what are you doing i said well i'm trying to be more exciting he goes you don't do pretty you do ugly he says you go do ugly ugly will make you money and he was right. The uglier I do, the better I do. So I, I leave all the fancy stuff to the other guys. I just, I'm a brawler and I'm a beast. So I just go out there and do ugly. It ain't pretty. 
It's not anything that anyone wants to emulate, but it gets the job done, and that's what that's what I do. Okay. Um, well, I, I don't know how much of that advice I'm going to take on board because I really want to come off the top row. I, I am, like, d determined, and if I get hurt, well, then you'll be able to say... Off the top rope, if you're going to come off the top rope, plan something with a higher percentage of success. Okay. So if he's incapacitated and flat on his back and you're dropping an elbow off the top rope or a big frog splash like Eddie Guerrero, that's that's cool. If he's on his feet and he has mobility, understand that cuts your percentage of success at least in half. So as long as you're smart enough to stack the percentages in your favor, then yeah, man, do your thing. Why not? It's your time. It's your time to do what you want to do and have fun. So do your thing. Yeah. Cool. Uh, what, what about the actual um, the day itself or the evening itself, the event? Obviously, oh, for us? Yeah, no, I mean, like for, for me going in there, obviously I have a few practice, a few, a few uh, training sessions, yeah. get comfortable with the, the surroundings. But when the bright lights are on, what, what's mm -hmm. different? Um, what, 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 what changes? Uh, what changes? You're going to have to learn how to harness all the energy. Um, there's going to be energy with the crowd. There's going to be energy of anticipation. You've imagined, you've envisioned, you've planned in your mind series of things that can happen, good or bad. Uh, find a place, and this will come naturally to you because you're a pro athlete and you've played sports. You know the energy you have before a game, those butterflies in your mm. stomach and your hands are tingling and you're on fire and you could rip the door off a bus if you wanted to at that moment. You're going to have that same energy. Get a place, breathe. Before you go out, focus your thoughts. You know, you've prepared to be there, you've trained, uh, you've done, you've invested the time to this point to do as well as you're going to do and you're going to do well. Go in there with a positive attitude and channel that energy. But most of all, remember to breathe. That's the best advice I can give you because you're going to be nervous in there and it's gonna, not going to be natural. So you're going to hold your breath. Just breathe, man. You breathe, relax, have fun. Go over your game plan. Know your game plan. It's going to be, I tell you what, it'll, it'll be addictive. Now, it'll be addictive. Yeah. And you're probably going to want to do this more after this. Hopefully this goes very well. But um, if you're getting into it now and you're that kind of a, I don't want to say adrenaline junkie, but you're competitive. So there's a bit of adrenaline to it. Um, yeah, you'll want to do it again. Yeah. Definitely. It, so. it, it's funny that because, you know, when I was playing, um, professional rugby league I, part of the attraction in the dressing room before I went out was something bad could, could happen today like yeah. and you're almost yeah. attracted to that danger and that uh, that level of yeah. risk is is a is a w was part of what um made me want to play the game so sure in, in, you know when you when you do something like this what what are the the chances of getting seriously hurt oh i it Anything can happen, especially as you keep your feet, you know, if you start going up on the top rope and doing things, you know, it's, uh, I did some boxing for a little while, um, uh, years ago, nothing professionally, but I was training, but I took it very seriously because it takes one punch to win a fight, one punch to knock you out, one punch to kill you and wrestling. And that resonates true with wrestling too, because wrestling is very dangerous. That's why we try to tell people, please don't do this at home where we do this in a controlled environment. Most of us doing this have extensively trained to understand, um, if possible, when to protect ourselves. And even as trained as some of us are, I mean, accidents happen. I mean, it takes, what, less than six pounds of pressure to break a neck? Mm. You know, so you land wrong in a fall, you don't tuck your chin right, you don't um, land as evenly as you should, um, your body's out of line. Yeah, you can hurt yourself pretty bad. You know, you can, it's, it's not for everyday people to walk in and try this at a serious level without training, but that's like any sport where there's contact. There's, if, unless, you know, like I, I say that, that it's serious, but at the same time, it's also, um, if you've got the right mindset for it and you put your time into training, um, that element of danger is there in the back of your mind and it is attractive. I agree. When you said that it, I, it resonates with me too, because you don't know, Am I going to blow a knee out? Am I going to herniate a disc in my back? Am I going to, you know, blow a shoulder out? Like all these things are highly possible. But as you do it more, it gets, that stuff goes away. It's more of uh, 
are we going to give the fans one hell of a show? Are they going to be blown away by this match? Are they going to remember what we did tonight? And are they going to be glad they spent money to come and see us? So I would say don't worry so much about the injury part and focus more on the part that this is going to be the time of your life and it's going to be great and you're going to do well and go out with a positive attitude and you're going to eat it alive. Yeah, Take cool. that energy and use it and uh, remember that moment in time. You know, it's funny, you know, you say there, but like th those reminders that come up at the start of the show is like, please don't try this at home. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't listens. know. I don't know if anybody listens to those at no. all. Like I know me and my mates certainly did like, no. oh yeah, no. please don't try this at home. Like literally every break no. time it was like, we're getting a wrestle on. Let's do it. No. <laughs> I, you don't know how many times it's just like, we'd have to do those PSA now. I said, you know, no one's listening to us when we say this, right? Like, mm -hmm. Probably people are doing this right now as we're talking yeah. because we brought yeah. it up. Right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, well, watch this. We're doing it right now. So it, it, it's, I mean, it's not too dissimilar to, like, please drink responsibly. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Six, six, yes. Six, yes. Like, yes. It, South Park have that uh, that episode where they're like, oh, drink, fun times, girls, hot chicks, you in a, a club having a drink. Please drink responsibly. It's like. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, no, yeah. Yeah. For all the. Yeah, the, there's the message, and then there's the reality of it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, uh, just quickly on um, on outsiders coming in. Um, what are your thoughts? Obviously, uh, your time at uh, WWE or WWF. I, I don't know what it was quite named at the time, but you had a, a few people come in. Floyd Mayweather. W what are your thoughts when uh, people from I guess different sporting backgrounds um, come and do what you've done for the overwhelming majority of your life? I think it's a great opportunity for the fans. I think it's a great opportunity for the talent. I mean, I've had been fortunate enough to work with Kevin Green, who's a football player, and uh, Dennis Rodman, and uh, uh, Floyd Mayweather, and done some stuff with Shaquille O'Neal, and did some stuff for the Pittsburgh Steelers. So um, uh, I wrestled a guy named Aki Bono, Chad, who was a former uh, sumo grand champion. You know, he was a Yokozuna champion. So. Um, it's great when you have recognizable figures from other sports or other entities come in. Um, it draws in new fans. And there's a, there's a great energy when you have something like that happen. It's good for business. It's good for the fans. It's good to mix things up in the show. Um, I love working with people like that. Uh, I had a great time working with Floyd Mayweather because Floyd Mayweather got it. You know, I mean, as soon as that red light came on, he knew how to be annoying and talk trash and cut promos. And he understood the the art of getting people emotionally invested to watch something. Um, Why well, you'd see he'd fight a lot of Latin American boxers on Cinco de Mayo, which is like a Latin holiday. So he would always try to schedule fights where he fought a Latin boxer. Like it's, uh, he knew how to tap into to the core of people and upset them so that somebody, they'd want to see him get his ass kicked. And a little bit, that's kind of what we do in wrestling. We give people an escape. There's always somebody to identify with in wrestling, uh, whether it's a, an evil boss or a bad coworker or, or somebody that never gives up, somebody that's, just, that's maybe smaller, that's got that huge fighting spirit that you identify with. Uh, there's always someone on every roster that a fan can identify with. And then when you couple that with uh, a sports or an entertainment person who has their own fan base, they're pretty excited to see them do something new like this. And I think it's a great crossover. And uh, I'm always happy to be a part of stuff like that. I think it works great. Because most people that come in have the right attitude. They're not, you know, they're not clowning around or being disrespectful about it. They come in, they know this is, uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. It's a moment in time. And they work really hard. Some people are just uh, pretty amazing at it, too. They're gifted at it. You know, they get it. So uh, it's it's all good for everyone, I think. I think it's a win-win all the way around. Uh, you, you know, you said about you, you potentially going the other way, the, the boxing. How close were you to having a uh, professional fight? <laughs> not not very close. I was 35 years old when I was doing it. So I mean, yeah, maybe if I'd have started at 19, it would have been, uh, it would have been a, a more serious venture. Uh, at 35, for me, it was to uh, to basically do something different, to get in shape, to make a change. Um, the boxing was something completely different and I had taken a year off from wrestling and I just wanted to make a change for my health. That was about the time I realized I needed to make a change. I mean, I was 537 pounds. 
I was smoking two packs of cigarettes a day and I just knew I needed to make a change. So I, I made a change. I boxed for 10 months. I trained five days a week, quit smoking, lost 121 pounds and uh, sparred with some professional boxers and got in there and did 12, 15 round sparring matches and uh, learned a lot of respect for, for boxing, uh, for the sport the technique, the skill set, and the willing to step over the top rope and know that somebody else is going to punch you in the face, you know. And there's, this, uh, there's a great saying that my boxing trainer used to say, it says, fatigue makes cowards of us all. And, buddy, you haven't been tired till you've been tired in a boxing match where you can't <laughs> hold your hands up and, you know, your hands keep dropping and then the other guy just punches you in the face. You're like, damn it, and you can't hold your hands up. It's uh, It was great to... Uh, it was a great 35-year-old midlife crisis to get my shit straight move. I'm glad I did it. <laughs> yeah. It, isn't it funny that, again, that attraction to to get into the wall? And and for most yeah. people, that wall of being fatigued and you can't get your hands up or I'm doing some running at the moment. And when you get to the certain point, you're like, oh, my God, I'm here at the wall again. Like, how am I going to get through? But there's something that makes you want to just keep on going back. It's such a funny um part of psyche that I think only a select group of people understand. I, I think understand it, but it's within all of us. Look at yeah, how, okay. You know, I'm gonna get too philosophical. Look how amazing human beings are, how we've overcome, you know, the environment between learning how to build shelter and fire and wars and famine and disease and all these things that the human evolution has had to get through, which is why sometimes I think um sports and, and entertainment and wrestling uh, resonate well with people because deep in the back of our minds, we understand that struggle. You know, we understand that, you know, in wrestling where the guy is, is beaten down, but he doesn't give up. He finds a way to pull through. He finds a way to get back to his feet and he finds a way to overcome. Um, that resonates with people because that's part of the human spirit. And then there's a few weirdos out there that love pushing themselves in physical competition and whether it's sports, athletics, weightlifting, boxing. Um, you go to a place where your mind's telling you, hey, you should quit. You should stop. And for whatever it is, it pushes you on. No, I can do a little bit more. I can do a little bit more. I can do a little bit more. And then, you know, before you know it, you've gone way past where originally where you wanted to quit. I think that's for me, I didn't pay attention in school, so I'm not very smart. So that's the <laughs> that's all I got. I'm just dumb enough to keep going. So <laughs> you, you know, on 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 some of the I, I guess the, the the angles that you hit as well in in uh, professional wrestling would be coming back from an unjust or unfair loss where you've been double crossed and you you know the referee the authority is distracted. Someone lands a cheap shot. I think most people can can resonate with that sure. where they be, feel like been blindsided by somebody yeah. else's bs yeah yeah resonates yeah. yeah um just on on the, the the sport i came from obviously you're here in australia have you, have you seen any uh nrl or, or rugby league in your time not in person no but i watch it all the time on social media i watch the clips and and it's funny i started getting more into it watching some of the uh female rugby players believe it or not, because it came up and there was a, um, one of these girls just running through the other girls and stiff arming them. And <laughs> it was the most aggressive. I was like, oh, my God, she would kick my ass all over the place. <laughs> like, you know, you just that determination and grit. And then I started, you know, seeing some of the stuff of you guys. And one of the old time legends about a guy, I guess, over here somewhere that lost a testicle in the first part of the match and still uh, kept going. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I'm like, okay, that's, you lose a ball and you still play. That's, <laughs> uh, my, you sir are the man. That's pretty tough. Uh, I love it though. You guys, and you know, everything where I come from, and it's not a knock on where I come from and I love my country, but everything's kind of safe and protected and we protect this and we protect that and there's paddings and, you know, you wear helmets when you ride bicycles now. And, you know, I come from an older generation that, didn't do a lot of that stuff. And then when you look at rugby, you know, you guys are just going balls to the walls, head to head, and it's ugly and it's violent and people have torn lips and broken noses and 
busted open eyebrows and stepped on broken fingers and I, I appreciate every bit of it. Mm. I, I'm an athlete. You know what it's like to work hurt, and I'm like, hell yeah. I mean, I'm too old to do that now. There's no absolute way in hell I would do that now, <laughs> but I respect it. Yeah, playing through through pain is is I guess a part. It comes with the territory. We uh, the NRL actually kicked off the season in Vegas last year, and I spoke to some uh, American uh, sub, well American people who that were new to our game. They were at the stadium, and they were just in awe at the fact that players were bleeding and allowed to can just continue on and they'd wipe yeah. it away and they'd just keep going. It's like, whoa, you guys are allowed to do this or you get knocked down, you don't come off, you just get up, yeah. dust yourself off and, and you go again. There's a real appeal, um, I well, feel. Well, I think that goes back to the warrior spirit because in the old days when you lined up two armies and the one side had their swords and shields and the other side had their swords and shields and everybody met in the middle, there was no timeout for that. There was no. no referee. There was, it was your will and determination to gain every inch that you could of territory, and and I definitely think that rugby uh, simulates or recreates that determination that you would have had to have had to have been like a, uh, you know, a Roman soldier or something like that back in the day. You know, it's uh, it, it's definitely not for the weak of heart. That's for sure. Yeah, that's most, why I'm glad I can sit on the side and watch. I'm cool with that. <laughs> most definitely. Uh, you, you said you, you've been at this a, a, a long time. Yeah. Two questions. How you've you, well, you spoke about some of the um, the surgeries that you that you've had the the replacements, but um, so what what's the motivation to keep going? Um, you know, it's funny because um, I have a lot of close friends that ask that very question. You know, and it pisses me off every time. It's like, oh, you've got nothing to prove. You've been through so much. Because I want to. Because I still enjoy it. Because I like being in the locker room. I like talking to the talent. I like going down that ramp. I like not knowing what's going to happen. And I like being able to perform in front of the crowd. And I like giving something to the fans that I've been doing for 30 years. And it's something that I'm good at. And it's something that I enjoy. So what? Yeah, some things hurt some days. I'm still enjoying it. When I get to the point where I'm not enjoying it anymore, then I step away. I choose when I step away. You know, you don't choose when I step away. I'm not giving this up because you think I should. Yeah. I'm not doing this to prove anything. I'm doing this because I genuinely have fun and I want to do it. You know, that's all there is. That's the only answer that needs to be given. I have fun doing this and I still want to do it. That's the end of it. Yeah. Are there any... Uh, what about achievements? Is there any dream matches or, or anything you're setting out to achieve, or it's just about having fun? Uh, right now, it's just about having fun. I mean, I've had a great career, had, and I've been fortunate enough to work some of the um, biggest stars this business has ever known. Um, I'm very humble and grateful for that. Uh, I don't know as far as dream matches go. I haven't had that dream opponent yet. Who, I don't know who it could be. There could be someone, most definitely, there's someone in our AEW locker room right now that will have my last match. You know, uh, and I look forward to that day, however that comes about, you know. So that's part of the beauty. I'm not a guy that looks at yesterday, and I'm not really a guy that looks too far into the future. I'm very much in the present. What's today? Maybe yeah. what's tomorrow, but what are we doing today? And I try to enjoy today as much as I can because the rest of that shit I can't control. I can't control stuff that I've already done. It's already happened. Yeah. I can learn from it, move on. What's coming in the future? I don't know. I can't control it. I'm not worried about it. I can probably think about it and try to prepare, but I'm still wasting time. I'm focused on what's today. What are we doing today to get better? What are we doing today to move forward and be happy? Well, and yeah. Today is what matters. I, I, I like that. I am going to tap into a little bit of the, the, the past, if that's okay, because sure. it, it, you've been at it for s such a long time um, and seen uh, so much change. What, 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 what's some of the biggest changes that you've seen in, in, in your time in the sport? Uh, the respect that women get in our sport now. I think it's absolutely way overdue. Um, for a long time in our sport, um, women didn't get the respect that they deserved, and they worked hard for less money, less, less recognition. Um, and I remember uh, many, many years ago, uh, seeing some girls wrestle uh, on one of our European tours and they put on an absolutely 
fantastic match. And uh, their psychology was good. Their uh, structure of their match was amazing. And they had the crowd behind them. Like, they were doing it well. And I remember turning around and telling the guys in the locker room that time, I said, you son of a bitch just better lace your boots up because those girls are going to end up in main event in WrestleMania one day. And they all kind of chuckled and laughed. Mm. And within a few years, those same girls did end up in main event in WrestleMania. So I am very happy to see that um, – Girls are treated with the respect that they deserve, given the recognition they deserve, the chance to compete and to be competitors, not managers or uh, trophy girls on the side. You know what I mean? I mean, they're legit competitors, and a lot of them are better wrestlers than I am. They know they know more wrestling holds. They know more wrestling maneuvers, and they've studied differently, and they're incredible competitors. And I think that's better for the business. The business has to evolve. It has to change. You have to bring in uh, – entities from all over the world to make the, the to make the show better and uh, that's the one thing that I've seen that I think has been uh, a tremendous positive yeah uh, we, we spoke a little bit about uh, about psyche of um, you know accepting injury accepting risk um, and some of the characters that that uh, attracts um, mm-hmm. so and, and again I'm thinking back to my time as a as a rugby league player there was some interesting characters in uh, in and around yeah. the, the dressing room and um, yeah. very much people of extremes and like to hit the town, so to speak. And, yeah, they were wild on the field and they were wild off it. Is there any uh, any people that sort of spring Rick to Flair. mind? Ric Flair. Rick Flair. Hands down, Ric Flair. Ric Flair um, was a hero of mine when I grew up because I grew up in the South, in South Carolina. <clears throat> and... Um, Rick used to cut those promos about limousine flying, jet plane riding, son of a gun. Mm. He had the Rolex watches, the you know the two thousand dollar money suits, the thousand dollar alligator shoes. That was Rick. And when I met Rick, one of my first road trips with Rick, um, I came down the escalator to pick up the rental car, and Rick Flair was at the bottom of the escalator. And I was very green in the business, like a couple of months, and I was a legit rookie. And Rick looks at him and goes, what kind of car did you get, Tadpole? I'm like, He's talking to me because I'm Tadpole. I'm not even a frog yet. I'm still the Tadpole. I said, I- I've got a Cadillac, sir. He says, I'm with you. And I'm like, holy shit, I'm, I'm driving Ric Flair. Oh, okay, all right. I mean, this is like a, you know, this is pretty big deal. So, you know, we drive, we go to the arena, we have our matches. I'm still freaked out. So, I'm, you know, Rick gets in the car. And uh, he says, uh, I said, uh, are we going to go get something to eat? He goes, eat? No, we're not going to eat. It's going to mess up our drink. We're going to the bar. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. So we go to the bar, and, and thank God this was before cell phone cameras because uh, I ended up so drunk. I was the one that ended up on the stage in my underwear getting tips. So, <laughs> <laughs> And uh, about, I think it was the next week, I got pulled into the WCW office with the late great Kevin Sullivan and and uh, some of the executives there. I don't remember if Eric Bischoff was there or not. He might have been, but this I remember Kevin Sullivan was the one that put me on, uh, told me I wasn't allowed to hang out with Ric Flair because he was a bad influence on me. You know, Ric Flair was. It didn't did, matter. Did I you still listen? Hung out with Ric yeah. Flair, no, no, no. I I saw the fun that Ric Flair was having and I wanted to be a part of it. But it was always funny because. Like I, I had to hang out with Rick in secret. Like I couldn't ride with him, but I'd have to. I'd have to meet him later at the bars and stuff. So, uh, yeah, I, it was. Uh, I mean, how do you say no to that kind of stuff back then? It was. Uh, it was a wild time, and every night was uh, an incredible experience. You know, every city was a brand new city, and guys that I grew up watching were were heroes. And and uh, these guys lived hard. They partied hard. They worked out. Even staying out all night drinking, they might stay out till three in the morning, close down the bars. Nine o'clock the next morning, those guys are in the gym working out, busting a sweat. And that's what they tell you all the time. Hey, best way to get bust a sweat, kid, get it out of your system. And they're working out with hangovers and they go out and wrestle 35, 40 minute nights that night and do it all over again, five nights a week. Like there was just, once they put their foot on the gas, it never came off the gas. And I was always amazed by that when I was younger. Like, wow, these guys can go. So there you go. There's, there's a lot of people like that in, um, in, the, in, in the rugby league circles where they just, well, it's amazing what guilt does as well. 
Like guilt, yeah. guilt drives you to train harder and work, and work harder and not let down your performance or your teammates because if you if you do, you know you can't do the party in as well. Yeah, yeah, you've got to show up and play, and that's the thing too. They never care what you did outside of it, long as you had a good match, you showed up and did what you're supposed to do business wise. Well, it didn't matter. You know, some guys would stay out two or three days in a row, but every night match time they were on 100, percent and then they would take off. And you wouldn't see them. I mean, I've I've known some tours where guys have disappeared for two weeks because they've gone on tour in Europe, and the last time we saw them was in Amsterdam, and then two weeks later they show up in Kansas. It's like, well, well what happened? To you? Well, we we kind of got lost, you know, one of those kind of things. <laughs> yeah, when you've got the squirrels yeah. running around, you that you don't want to know. Um, is there any? Yeah, I'd yeah, rather yeah. not discuss this right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Just it, to say that we're glad to be home. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Is there is there anyone that springs to mind? I mean. There's some former teammates of mine that were literally like time bombs, just waiting to go off. That you'd just be looking at, going, "Oh God, no, I'm gonna have to maybe babysit them." But once once they go off, you're into yeah. into rescue mode. Is there anyone that springs to mind? Uh yeah, um, <laughs> uh, yeah. There's 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 a couple of talents that I knew that some of them weren't very sociable, you know, and you just knew, okay, I need to. This is going to end badly if this person keeps talking to him. Like, hey, mate, uh, hey, buddy, come on, you, you want to move on now? You know, you end up uh, like I ended up turning like a security guard at a nightclub or something, trying to, you know, some of the guys did not, uh, did not play well with others. You know, they were great with our squad, but they weren't very sociable with others. I, I'll tell you a funny story about this guy. Years ago, when we first came over here to Australia. Uh, Brock Lesnar came over here, right? And Brock's not a guy for big crowds. And he's the first one to tell you he doesn't like people. Like Brock, if Brock likes you, you know it. If he doesn't like you, you know it. I mean, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no gray area with him. And back then, the fans could literally meet you right at the gate at the airport. You know, like, I mean, and we came out of the, the jet bridge there. There was two, 300 fans there. They tried to have a little rope thing off to keep the fans back so we could get to the baggage claim to get to where we were going. And when I came out, there was pictures and everybody screaming. I knew Brock was about 30 feet behind me. So I wanted to see this. So I kind of stopped and, and waited. And he comes up and he's got his sunglasses on and like, Everybody started screaming at him as soon as he came out, just screaming crazy pictures going. And I watched Brock take his sunglasses off like this. And he looked up at everybody. And he did that thing where he flinches. I watched 300 people gasp because <laughs> every single person there thought he was coming for them. <laughs> I said, you just flinch scared 300 people. And he's like, you know, and he's, that's... That's his MO, but it was pretty funny. So. Hey, uh, I, I touched on a couple of eras, um, the NWO and the Attitude Era. Right. Is there anything that, uh, or, or a time that you that you look upon more favorable? Is there something that you, you really look back and go, wow, that was a, such a cool thing to be a part of? I think early in my career, in the beginning of the Attitude Era, you know, with the NWO, I think that holds a special place in my heart because everything was brand new. Everything was brand new. Some cities I'd never been before, countries I've never been before. Um, really just young and taking in everything that it was to be uh, a pro wrestler. It was an amazing, uh, amazing time. And then kind of uh, five, six years after the Attitude Era, I'd say around 2008, 2012, were some great years for me. Just uh, my work rate was different. My understanding of my sport, my professionalism, my relationships uh, with the guys in the locker room where we were all firing all cylinders. And, and I knew my role and knew what I brought to the table and they trusted in me and what I brought to the table. The work rate during those times to me were very special. Um, you know, and then Later on, my career is the same thing. Uh, seeing younger talents that start out, and you know, and then now the stars that they've evolved to and become, and success, and and uh, it's been a really cool journey to be a part of all of that. But 
like I said, man, I wake up, dude, and I'm the luckiest man on the planet. I really am. Um, I'm grateful for my career. I'm grateful to work in AEW with uh, a company that um, really lets the talent be authentic and grow in their own ways, and I get to be a part of that structure and help build. Uh, I'm, I'm the luckiest guy on the planet, man. I'm grateful. Well, I, I guess for, for someone like me, the, the nostalgia I have for, the, for those two particular areas are just, w w they'll always be the greatest. I guess it's like any sports fan. It's always the great, like the past was always the greatest. Um, yeah. That was a special time too, because a lot of the stuff we were doing had never been done yeah. before. I mean, you know, you were blowing up buses and filling cars with cement and <laughs> pulling tanks up to buildings and... You know, there was just so many things that were just nothing was off limits and everything was brand new. And it was the changing of the guard from the old school white meat baby face with a white cowboy hat and the black cowboy hat. And then, you know, the anti-hero comes along. who yeah. really should be a bad guy because he flips everybody the bird. But yet he's your favorite because he says, yeah, screw the boss. And that's how I feel. And then you started having these characters that resonated uh, you could resonate more with. They weren't so much cartoon characters. They were, they were people that were expressing your attitude and your views and the way you either wanted to be or the way you felt. So, yeah, that was a hell of a time. Yeah. That's pretty good. Um, j just final question: that when when the ring broke, was it was it you and Goldberg? No, it was me and Lesnar. You and Lesnar. I actually broke it three times. That's my claim to fame. I've broken three rings. Well, so there you go. Once with Lesnar, once with Mark Henry, and once with Braun Strowman. Did. did did you know that was going to happen? You know, yeah, we knew it was going to happen. Really? For years, for years, I did that thing. I said, no, it was an accident. It was 5,000 pounds support beam. Like, I did the whole thing they call kayfabe, and then somebody in our company, um, the company I worked for then, stooged it off, and I was just like, okay, well, if you're not going to hold to it, then I'm not going to lie to anybody either. Um, yeah, but it was a pretty cool moment in time Uh when you do our job right at its peak performance, they all know that there's a predetermined outcome, it's entertainment. But if you can do your job well enough and you can get them for that fraction of a second where they will sit there and go, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, I know it's all, but that one time, then you've done your job. That's the magic you look for. That magic you look for where you make a fan for life and you connect with them is when they go, yeah, 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 but that one time, you suspend belief. Well, every time, we, every time we go watch a movie, we, we know it's not real, but we still, well, yeah. some people cry, some people get emotional, yeah. some people get shocked. Like, we know it's yeah. not real when we go to the movie theaters. But yeah. you, you're right. The way, you, Same thing in wrestling. You have to make that connection. That's the one thing I tell the younger guys. You can do all the flips and bumps and, and all that athletic stuff, and that's great. The biggest reaction in your match should be the finish because that's the end of your movie. And everything you've done during that movie is for the end. And the end better be the biggest reaction. I don't care what else you did. If the end's not the biggest reaction, then your formula is wrong and you've done something wrong. Well, I, I, I watched that clip. I th it, yeah, it was you and Lesnar. Sorry, I got mixed up with Goldberg. But at the end, you guys just lay there, and the the yeah. reaction in the crowd is just like yeah. shock, and it, yeah. they are just in, like they're in a yeah. state of euphoria. Like they're almost the crowd blocked the camera in a way. Yeah, it's like yeah, they're just got... going off. Yeah, and that's that's a treat that's hard to do. Uh, it's even hard to do nowadays because there were so many moments, you know, during that attitude era and during that time that were able to be recreated. And that's another thing about AEW that I like is these kids, keep calling them kids, they're young men and young women, but I'm older, but I mean that in a, young, in a great way. Our talent has the ability to think outside of the box, to be creative, to come up with their own ideas. And uh, they're working on it. And they're going to find a way to create their own moments and create their own connections with the audience in their moments in time and it's a it's a really cool thing for me where i'm at in my career to sit back and and watch that and and see that develop and see it click in their brains when they know oh yeah i got this you nailed it <laughs> yeah nailed it and it's yeah. like yeah you did bud yeah you did
Yeah, well, I, I'm looking forward to, to getting into the ring, and I really appreciate your time, Paul. Keep the um, damn feet on the ground. Stay off the top yeah. rope. <laughs> I'll ignore that last bit of advice, but thanks so much. Know. And, uh, yeah, look forward to, to witnessing you up in, in Brisbane in, in February next year. All the very best. Yeah, definitely. Hopefully, look, I'm going to hook up with you on social media, so after I want you to, to let me know how your match goes. When's your match? Uh, October 13th. Okay, definitely. I, I want to know how it turns out. So uh, uh, if I can't see it, you're going to have to send me a clip of it so I can break your balls and tell you what you did wrong. <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll definitely, or I'll definitely. tell you what you did right, too, because yeah. you got to get, you know, got to get both sides. Yeah, pros All and right. cons. All right, cheers, mate. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank cheers. you for having me. Have a great day.